today we're going to be doing Ira Wordworthy by Stephen Cosgrove and illustrated by Wendy Edelson. Further than far to the very edge of the horizon <clears throat> was a path bordered in lacy fern. If you walked down that path, in search of lost hopes and dreams, you would find a land called Barely There. Barely There. A land where old fat owls tell stories true and laugh and laugh, but never at you. With clouds that fly and the morning mist seems to sigh. Barely There. Barely There. If you followed that path as it twisted and turned, at first you might feel lost, but the deeper you went, the more you would find that it all began to look oh so familiar. If you followed it further still, the twisting path would turn into a softly ro rooted red clay road, rutted red clay road. Things were a bit more organized here. Plants were planted in orderly rows of corn, wheat, and barley. Houses set back from the dusty road with shutters drawn and porches swept clean. Woodchucks, gophers, and old guinea hens plowed and tended the fields that blended with nature's wondrous bounty. The dusty red clay road wound through fields and clusters of cabins and cottages past the school with its rusty old bell and ended at the absolute center of the land of Barely There. It was here at the edge of this tiny town square that the only store stood, wood word worthies feed, seed, and mercantile. Three worn, rickety steps up, and you were on the porch, where barrels and boxes of seeds became chairs and benches. An old screen door screeched, creaked open, and, and crash slammed shut, as outside walked an old gray badger, dressed in a starched white shirt, a black bow tie, and a crisp, and crisp clean apron tied round his chubby waist. This was Ira Wordworthy the proprietor of the mercantile, who always swept his porch with a bundled broom of hazel hay as the sun came up to greet the day. The inside of this door was jumbled in an odd sort of way. Oh yes, the vegetables were stacked neatly together, rolled ropes and twines hung tidily from the rafter pegs, all was neat, nice, and natty, just like Ira's starched shirt. But odd, just the same. Large cans of paint were on shelves with large cans of beans. Boxes of dried soup were mixed with boxes of soap. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for the way old Wordworthy inventoried his goods. He happily dusted the cans and boxes while he whistled a tune, never quite understanding why folks scratched their heads in wonder when they shopped in his store. But Word Wordworthy's feed, seed, and mercantile was more than just a store. It was a meeting place, the center of all activity. It was a place where frumpy farmers could stand around and whi whistle in the wind about the weather and other wonders. It was here, too, that the children of Barely There came after school to buy a, a soda or, or sarsaparilla and giggle about those growing up things. They would buy their drinks and sometimes a per persimmon or plum and then sit on the boot thumped steps, and read a book from the library. It was odd, but Ira didn't like the children sitting around on his steps. He didn't mind them drinking a pop or eating a plum, but it just plain bothered him that they sat around reading. Arr. Why can't they take their books and flip those pages someplace else? 
he grumbled as he dusted the rows and rows of cans. Books and learning are a waste of time. Those kids should be learning a trade or mastering the fine art of farming. He fussed and fumed. Finally, one day, he could stand no more, and he stormed into the back room of the store. There he found paint, brush, and board, and with a mighty flourish, he painted a sign, an important sign for things to come and barely there. He worked and worked for the longest time, and finally, with a bit of paint splattered on his nose and eyeglasses, he whistled in satisfaction as he stood back and looked at his handiwork. The next afternoon, just before school let out, he hung the sign on the porch outside. He bent a couple of nails in the process, but the sign was hung just the same. When the school bell rang, the children, as was their wont, rushed to the store to buy their tasty, street, tasty treats. Ira stood and watched, arms crossed, tapping a soft, furry foot on the porch. The children looked at him looked curiously at the sign, then dashed inside. One by one, as Ira glared, they grabbed and paid for their goodies. Then they zipped down the stairs and off to the meadows to read a bit and munch a bunch. Satisfied that the sign had done its duty, the crotchety old storekeeper went back inside. The last of the children to leave the store was a shy little raccoon called Rita. The screen door squeaked and slammed as she stepped outside with an apple in her hand. She found a sunny spot on the stairs, and there she sat down to read a book. Ira's eyes opened angrily opened wide as he peered at her through the window from inside. There she was, first standing, now sitting below his fresh new sign. And he was sure Rita pretended she didn't see it. That girl must be blind, raged Ira as he stormed out the door. Ahem, said he in a grumbling way. Maybe you didn't see the sign. Oh, yes, Mr. Wordworthy, sir, she replied in the sweetest of tones. I saw the sign. It is very pretty. Ready? Pretty indeed, he roared as he tapped the sign with his furry finger. This sign says that all children of the younger persuasion are not to litter, loiter, or lay around here. Then to his shock and chagrin, little Rita looked up at the sign and quietly said, doesn't. Then, my little furry friend, he glared, just what does the sign say? Rita squinted her eyes and looked at the sign again. It doesn't say anything. Ira looked at the sign, squinting in concentration. Besides, added Rita, why do you care if I sit on your porch and read a book? The little raccoon's gentle tone softened old Ira as his chin dropped to his chest. A small stringy tear trickled from his eye. Because I'm jealous, he truthfully said, for I can't read, not a word, nary a word, nary a letter. Sure enough, if you looked carefully at the sign, you would see that it was nothing more than squiggles, wiggles, and smears. It was very pretty, but it said nothing. Every night thereafter, when the store was closed at half past dark, Rita sat in candles flickers and taught Ira how to read and write. As time went on, the old badger learned to make his letters strong, and soon he could read to himself rather than being told. The little raccoon loved playing teacher, and she would diligently grade his papers and listen intently as he read his lessons through and through.
From then and thereafter, Ira, Ira Wordworthy store was a haven for children and their books. Their mercantile became very organized as Ira learned to read the writing on his goods. He had known all the time that soap didn't go of soup. He just couldn't read the labels. Oh, and that screen door squeaked and slammed all day long as children rushed in and out with sweets to eat and good books to read. Business was good, but Ira's mind was even better as he read book after book after book. Minds do matter in the land. Minds do matter in the land of barely there. And books are better when read and fed to eager little minds. Everything turn turned out pretty well, even though old Ira never quite learned how to spell in the land of barely there. <laughs>